I think that's everything. Yep, I think we're all set. Ready to start rolling? Ready when you are. Hi, I'm Trista. And I'm Abby. This is Dazzling Dirigibles. A documentary on how blimps are made and how they work. You've seen it on TV at sporting events like the Super Bowl and the World Series. If you're lucky, you've even seen it with your own eyes flying in the sky above you. The Goodyear blimp has inspired and entertained people around the United States for years and years. But have you ever wondered what makes this strange vehicle work? How is it built? How does it fly? Those were our questions when we started this project. And here, at the end of our film, we'd like to recap what we learned in our journey to find the answers to those very questions. Why was the blimp built in the first place? The answer? Man's curiosity with flight. The story goes back to... The Montgolfier brothers in 1783 came up with a paper balloon. And that balloon was filled, they thought, with smoke, was the lifting gas, and was the beginning of man flight. The first problem was they just went with the wind. So in order to get to a blimp, you have to find some way to put a motor on and put fins on it so it has control. Mm -hmm. And from there, we had to go from materials for the hull up to the current rubberized fabric. And we had to go from smoke to helium. Today, Lockheed Martin and Goodyear have gotten the construction and flight of limbs down to a science. And as we spoke with experts throughout our film, we realized that nearly all of our answers to our questions are based in science and math. So what did we learn? We learned that measurement is essential in the design and construction of blimps. So you can see we have this fin assembly area here. And basically, this is all pre-measured and pre-laid out so that when we're putting everything together, we can't make a mistake doing it. Because as you can imagine, you don't really want to make mistakes when you're trying to put something like this together. Or you say, oh, it's 10 inches too large or 10 inches too small or something like that. We also learned how ratio and proportion are used in the design and construction of blimps. You would have big problems if you didn't take care of your proportions. For instance, if you put too much weight on and not enough helium, your blimp may not take off. But if you put too much helium and not enough weight, your blimp might actually float away. Surface area and volume are important as well, and both are used during the design and construction of blimps. Once we've calculated the surface area of the envelope, we can use that information in several useful ways. One is to estimate the amount of fabric required to build the, the, the envelope. Uh, another is, in the case of the Goodyear blimp, to determine how much paint is required to cover it. How do you know how much helium you need? Well, that depends on how big of a load you want to lift. A thousand cubic feet of pure helium can only lift about 66 pounds at ground level. So if you took the weight of the airship itself, the weight of the passengers and crew members and the fuel that you want to carry, added all those weights together and divided by 66, that would tell you the number of cubic feet you'd need. It's important to know about the structure of the elements. Understanding the structure of matter helps to explain why helium is lighter than air. Molecules behave differently, and a firm understanding of these different properties help explain how blimps become airborne. Now these molecules out here are these big, massive molecules of these heavy gases, as there are of the helium inside. So the number of helium molecules in our artificial balloon here, because they're at the same pressure as the atmosphere, is approximately the same as these monstrous molecules outside. And these guys, two of these, don't weigh anywhere near what two of these weigh. And so this is heavier, pushes down, this is lighter, just like a bubble in water, it goes up. To fully understand how a blimp is able to fly, you need to understand gas laws. Well, essentially, there are two type of laws that we have to deal with. The change in pressure as we go up and down in altitude is one of them, and the other one has to do with temperature change. As we go up in altitude, like I was saying, the outside air pressure is decreasing, so the helium is expanding. And as we come back down, the atmospheric pressure is increasing, so it's starting to push in on the blimp and actually increasing the pressure on the ship, and you have to be putting some air back in there because of the contraction of the helium. Vice versa, when you go up in altitude, it gets cooler. 
So as you go up and out to the helium is going to start contracting because as things get cooler, this gas gets cooler, it starts contracting. And when the ship comes down to uh, where it's warmer or if the ship's just sitting on the ground and the sun's beating on it, the sun's going to really heat the helium and it's going to start to expand. Buoyancy is one of the most important concepts to learn if you want to know why blimps work as flying machines. The blimp is filled with helium, which has a density that's about 15 times less that of the atmosphere around it. So when you fill the blimp with helium, it achieves its buoyancy because of that difference. Now, because the blimp is made out of a lot of lightweight materials, there's a lot of leftover buoyancy. So that reserve buoyancy can be used to lift a payload. Usually it's passengers, but sometimes could be supplies. A major difference between hot air balloons and dirigibles is that blimps can be steered once they've taken flight. With that in mind, an understanding of the basics of motion and forces will help to explain how blimps are able to move through the air. It's an aerodynamic shape like a lifting body, and it actually generates lift like a wing or a lifting body, you know, like the space shuttle, and when it generates lift as it comes back into uh, the Earth's atmosphere. We're flying around in the Earth's atmosphere, and the shape generates lift. If you point the nose up a little bit, it generates lift. If you point the nose down, it generates a negative lift. Does friction play a part in how the blimp flies? Uh, yes, it does, because of uh, all, everything that's attached to the airship uh, generates uh, drag or friction through the air molecules, and that actually slows the airship down as we're flying through the air. It's helpful to have an understanding of mapping and navigation techniques to understand how blimp's flight courses are planned. We use maps obtained from the government. They're called aeronautical charts, and some of the information it includes on them is a topographical information, elevations, airport information, and also includes frequencies we need along our route. How do blimp pilots know where they are? When we're in good weather, we use a concept called pilotage, and that is where you look at your map and you look out the window at the ground to see what you're by, and you can, you can tell where you are by, say, intersections of roads, uh, relation of a lake to a city, stuff like that, and we also can use a compass to set our direction or our course. It's also helpful to understand how weather conditions affect a blimp's ability to fly. Change of like from a sunny day to a cloudy overcast day uh, can affect uh, um, our lift for the day. Uh, can also affect uh, the ballonet size uh, of the blimp. That's like the airbags or the air chambers inside the blimp. Uh, it can also affect the, the weight of it. If it's from a sunny day to a rainy day, that rain will actually add water weight to the blimp and make it heavier. So we're always constantly checking the weather to see if there's going to be any sudden changes to it. So that's our documentary. We hope you enjoyed our film as much as we enjoyed making it. Man's innate curiosity is at the core of the invention of lighter-than-air vehicles. And our curiosity about the blimp has led us to better understand how blimps are made and how they work. The pioneers of lighter-than-air, Etienne and Joseph Montgolfier, discovered more than a century ago that curiosity, some determination, and a lot of creativity can lead to great achievements. And that holds true to this day.